If seven is the perfect number, then I would argue that he uses the number 666 to stand for that which is evil and that which is opposed to God. So I don't understand the 666 to refer to uh, a particular individual who fits that number. Instead, I think John is saying this beast is not 777. It doesn't represent goodness and beauty and truth, but it's 666. It represents that which is evil, that which is opposed to God. Welcome to the Crossway Podcast a show where we sit down with authors each week for thoughtful interviews about the Bible, theology, church history, and the Christian life. I'm Matt Tully, and today I'm talking with Tom Schreiner. Tom is the James Buchanan Harrison Professor of New Testament Interpretation and Associate Dean of the School of Theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's also the author of a number of books and biblical commentaries, including one on the Book of Revelation in Crossway's ESV Expository Commentary series. Today, Tom and I discuss the book of Revelation. He reflects on the best way to approach the book when studying it for the first time, explains what the mark of the beast is really all about, and offers some words of counsel and encouragement for pastors hesitant to preach through Revelation in their churches. Let's get started. Well, Tom, thank you so much for joining us today on the Crossway Podcast. Uh, Matt, it's, uh, it's great to be with you today. So I think if we're all honest, uh, most of us Christians would probably not know what to do with the book of Revelation. I think for many of us, it feels pretty overwhelming maybe at times or confusing or just hard hard to really get into. Before someone were to start digging into Revelation for the first time, what would you want that person to keep in mind? Yeah, I, I think I'd say realize that when you come to Revelation, that it's going to fit with, it's going to cohere with, it's going to agree with what you find in the rest of the New Testament. You're not, you're not going to find s- some strange new doctrines that you haven't seen anywhere else. Uh, so I think that's helpful because I think some people think now we're in- entering a world of, of a uh, newly disclosed mysteries. And I don't, I don't think that's what the book's about. Interesting. So what do you think are some of the other kind of key misconceptions that people often have about the book of Revelation? That's a hard question to answer, Matt, because there's so people have so many different, you know, there's different interpretive strategies for interpreting the book. But what, I think one key misconception is that what we have in uh, Revelation is a prophecy chart that after you read the book, you can you can kind of you know move through and you have a an outline of what will happen in the future. And and instead instead I would say what we have in Revelation is that we have re- recapitulation of, of the same events told from from various perspectives which i'm i'm happy to talk uh, more about but then maybe the second the second misconception which which fits with what i said earlier but i think it's worth saying again i think people don't expect when they read revelation that it's going to reaffirm the main things we already know in the christian faith so I say to my students, look at how central the sovereignty of God is in Revelation. Notice how prominent the cross of Christ is. Uh, consider how believers are called upon to persevere to receive a final reward. Um, see how God wins the ultimate victory over over evil. I mean, those are all things we're taught elsewhere. Those are those are some of the main themes in Revelation. So I think people come into the book expecting something so unusual that sometimes they don't see that it that it coheres with what we read elsewhere. Yeah, that's so interesting. I do think that we we often view Revelation as this book focused on the end of days and these future apocalyptic events, which it, it does talk about that stuff. But I think you're right. We 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 kind of miss uh, the spiritual benefit that comes from 
it reaffirming things that maybe we already do know about God. And and you you brought up something that I think uh, contributes to the confusion, and that is the book is apocalyptic. It, uh, it's an apocalyptic genre, so apocalyptic has a lot of symbolism. You know, we have we have unusual visions. So I, I don't want to take away from the the fact that y- yes, there's interpretive challenges here, and there are there are in the book difficult passages, but we can so focus on the difficult that we can miss the mainstream message of the of the of the book. So it seems like the history of Christian interpretation of the book of Revelation can be broken down into four broad categories. Uh, so the first category of people would be those who think that all of the events recorded in the book already happened. So soon after the book was probably written in the days of the Roman Empire. So that's the first category. Second category would be those who think that the book is speaking prophetically about events that will happen in the future when Jesus returns. And I think that's probably, for our listeners today, would maybe be the default way that we often think about the book of Revelation. Uh, And then there's those who think that the events of the book happened throughout church history. So it was prophetic at the time it was written, but things have been happening throughout the history of God's people uh, since Christ. And then finally, those who think that the whole book is sort of just symbolic and doesn't necessarily correspond to real historical events. Uh, First, do you think that's a fair breakdown of the the broad ways people have viewed Revelation over the years? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good uh, summary. And and then it seems like uh, each of these views has been popular or um, promoted by certain groups of people, uh, of Christians at different times in history. Can you kind of summarize, you know, who has been proponents of each of these different views? Yeah, well, let me take those one by one. I mean, first, let me, and, and you can jump in after each one if you want to. So first, let's take that first view that Revelation is uh, basically fulfilled in the first century. So, you know, there's there's really, I mean, I'm being overly simplistic, but let's talk about two varieties of that view. First, there are uh, liberals who hold that view. By liberals, I mean those who don't think that Scripture is ultimately without error. So they'll say, look, John, John expected Jesus to come soon, the whole book to be fulfilled in the first century, and he got it wrong. Jesus didn't come back. Uh, John made a mistake. Uh, He thought Jesus would come soon. It's obviously not true because 2,000 years have passed. So that's that's the liberal view. Then there's there's an evangelical view, which usually argues that the book was written in the 60s and that Jesus... uh, Jesus returned, he came soon in the judgment of Jerusalem when Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. So that's that's a common common view as well. Now, I don't I don't hold to I don't hold to either of those views, but I would say the uh, there's a truth in this view, and that is the truth in this view is yes, this book was written to people in the first century, it related to their lives. And yes, it was it was being fulfilled at least in significant ways during their lifetime, and I, I think we can. So I think we can take something good out of that view without embracing uh, it entirely. Yeah, that's interesting. Then, what would you say about that second view? Then that the book is speaking uh, only about future events that will happen when Jesus returns. Yeah, yeah, I'd say something similar here. I think the, you know, the uh, we could call that view the futurist view, the 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 notion that it, the book is fulfilled in the future. Well, obviously, there's a lot of truth in that. Jesus hasn't come back yet. He hasn't brought in the kingdom. Not everything prophesied in this book has come to pass. I I I think the weakness of the fu- futurist view is a uh, is is the opposite of the first view we talked about. It doesn't see enough how the book was fulfilled in the first century and how it relates to uh, the historical context. Hmm. Yeah, and then how about that the view that the events described in Revelation 
uh, or the prophecies there were fulfilled, have been fulfilled throughout church history? Yeah, that that view uh, is the view I have the most trouble with. Very few interpreters would argue that view today, because if you if you see the book as a prophecy of events throughout church history, it becomes very arbitrary, I think, and and usually, usually that's especially emphasized with the seven letters, so that the first. You know, the first letter is the early church started out really passionate, and then it lost its first love. And then people almost always say, well, now today we're the Laodicean church, we're we're lukewarm. But the problem with that is those letters weren't written to us. Those letters aren't actually prophecies. Those letters were written to, to real cities. And John's talking about what's happening in those cities. So to, to construe those chapters as a prophecy, I think is uh, is flawed. Now, and 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 I think almost all the readings that read this as oh this relates to all of church history are quite arbitrary. Is there anything good about that view? I I would say, I think it goes overboard. But the but the I try to see the good in every view, and and I think there's a grain of truth in this view. The book relates. To Christians all through history. So Christians all through history could read Revelation and be helped by it, and it applied to them. That's different from saying, though, that it's actually a prophecy of uh, what's happening in, say, the year 1000, the year 1500, the year 1700. I I find those readings hard to believe, and like, and like I said, hardly anybody argues that anymore. Okay, and then that last view then is that the whole book is really just symbolic. It's full of symbolic imagery that really isn't intended to correspond to real historical events. Uh, what would you say about that view? Yeah, I, th- I think I think to say that it's that it doesn't correspond to real historical events, I think even people who say the book is symbolic would say, that's not quite what I'm saying. So say the beast is a symbol of Rome. So so it's they, they would say, look, the beast is symbolic, but it's symbolic of something. So I, I don't think anybody says it's not symbolic of anything that relates to history. But I think the, the advantage of this view is that it's spared from the kind of arbitrary... Uh, strange interpretations that some people offer. You know, like, like let me mention a wild one. You know, uh, when John says in Revelation 12 that the woman is spared by the two wings of the eagle, well, an extreme futurist that I read said, hey, that's the United States Air Force, <laughs> which is, when clearly the symbolic view would say, no, that's going back to Exodus 19.3, where the Lord delivers his people on eagle's wings. So I think the symbolic view, uh, there's a lot of truth in it, uh, that, that we, we need to be careful about over-reading, over-reading the book. I, su- I suppose the danger, the danger in the symbolic view is if you don't connect it with anything in the real world. If the the book only says if all you get out of the book is which this this is the main message of the book but I think it says more than this God wins Satan loses God's people are rewarded y- yes absolutely that's true I, I think everybody would agree that that's what the book is about it says a little more than that so as you then think about these four views and and you've sort of highlighted dangers and maybe some Uh, helpful emphases that each view would have, where do you land? How do you kind of put them all together? Or how do you think about this question of how we should read the book? How do we kind of approach the book personally? I would hold to a a combination view, I think. there's we, We need to read in its historical context the first view. We need to recognize, second view, that all the prophecies aren't fulfilled. Third view, we also recognize we can apply the message to today at 
any time. And then fourth view, uh, we do recognize that the view that the, the book is fundamentally symbolic. So we have to be careful about over-literalizing uh, what it's saying. We have to be careful about over-reading the connection, which I think, I mean, who's most guilty of that? The futurist view. The futurist view tends to overread the the language or the images that are used, and and usually what it does is it connects it to uh, contemporary events. Hmm. Well, and let's let's jump into that one. I think probably one of the prime examples uh, that is often very confusing to us, or we have speculative ideas. Maybe we've seen it represented in uh, popular culture or in fiction. Uh, but is the the mark of the beast. So you already referenced this a little bit earlier. Uh, and I just want to read a little section from Revelation 13, which is where we we hear this language of the mark of the beast. And then I'd love to kind of talk through that with you. So Revelation 13 verses 1 through a little bit further on in the, the chapter, uh, John writes, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. And then later John goes on to talk about how both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, will be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast on the, or, the, or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So uh, before we talk about the mark itself, let's just talk about that beast. Um, We kind of have that vivid description that it sounds like this (laughs) mythical creature, a combination of multiple animals what or who is it? You, you've kind of already alluded to this, but just walk us through how you understand uh, the beast. Yeah. So the the passage you read, the beginning of the passage, you know, com- compares the beast right to uh, these various animals, and so the first thing, the so this is just a key for interpreting Revelation is if you just read that and you've never read any other part of the Bible, you just think, what in the world's going on? I mean, <laughs> why, why, why is he doing this? But the key, the key to reading Revelation, I would say, so this is so important for us, is not to engage in what I call newspaper eschatology, which is what a lot of people do today. They, they read something like that in Revelation, and then they go to the newspaper and they try to figure out what it means. But I think that's exactly the wrong way. The, the language of the beast that John uses, those who know their Bibles well know that he's, he's referring to Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel chapter 7 talks about these uh, four beasts. And they refer to four empires, that uh, starting with Babylon. And then uh, Media Persia, and then Greece, and then Rome. So Daniel's talking about these four empires that uh, resist Israel, resist the people of God. Well, John John picks up that language of the beast from Daniel seven. So there, so there we see right from the beginning. Ah, if you know the Old Testament, John John gives a signal to the readers. When I'm talking about the beast, I'm talking about government. I'm talking about a governing authority. And I mean, this is a longer argument, but I think what John is telling us is, look, this beast is a combination of all the beasts in Daniel chapter 7. He's that fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7, and I would argue that fourth beast is Rome. So so John, if you know Daniel, but, but here's our problem, right? Our problem is most of us don't know the Old Testament that well. And so that makes Revelation hard. So then turning to the mark itself, um, what's the purpose of this mark? So if we know that the beast then is Rome, 
uh, what's going on with this idea of a mark on a forehead or on a, on a, a hand? Yeah, well, the, the first thing I'd say is notice, notice it's a means of persecution. It's a means of singling out uh, those who belong to the beast and those who don't. So there's, there's economic discrimination uh, against those who, uh, who belong, belong to the Lord. Now, now, I mean, here's a, here's a key question, and, and good people disagree, but is that mark, is there, is there a literal mark? And, and, and I would argue there's not. And now I could be wrong on that. We'll see, we'll see um, uh, if uh, in the future there's a mark. But I think he alludes to Ezekiel chapter 9, where there's a mark, uh, there's a mark put on those who belong to God, and then and then there's those who are wicked. So um, I, I don't think we ought to interpret such marks literally because of Ezekiel chapter nine, and and so it's just a way of signaling those who uh, those who belong to God and those who don't. Hmm. So as you think, as we think about like church history and just the history of interpretation of this idea of the mark of the beast, what are some of the ideas that people have had about what this mark would be if it was a literal mark? Well, uh, you know, regardless of whether it's a literal mark or not, the, the most popular interpretation in critical scholarship is that John is referring to the Emperor Nero, who was the emperor in Rome from A.D. 54 to A.D. 68. And Nero, you know, he started out good, but he ended up being a very wicked, cruel emperor. And he, uh, you know, when the fire of Rome came, he started to persecute Christians. When Nero, after Nero died, there was a, there was a a great fear that he was going to come back and uh, wreak all kinds of havoc uh, on, on Rome. So people think that Many people think that John is picking up that idea that Nero is, is, is going to return. So that's, you know, early on, I mean, in, at least in terms of critical scholarship, that's the most, uh, the most likely view. Uh, I'll have more to say about that. But then throughout history, people have tried to identify who, who this beast is in terms of a particular individual, and um, oh, I can't even remember all the names that have been suggested. But you know, in our own day, I mean, I'm I'm older. I've heard John F. Kennedy and uh, Henry Kissinger, and um, I mean, so many, so many people. I mean, even you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, even Reagan, right? Reagan's name, Ronald Wilson Reagan. Each each uh, each name has six letters. So, well, and that that's the interesting thing about this is it it does seem like there is uh, Christians have oftentimes really gotten into trying to tease out almost like a hidden meaning behind some of these things. Um, and a lot of that has to do even with that number that that classic number six six six, which I think culturally speaking today it, it kind of has taken on its own. Uh, even like creepy significance, even outside of the church. And so could, could you walk us through what's going on with that number? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say that's exactly right. I, I remember when I was in a restaurant and the change was six, 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 six dollars and 66 cents. And the, uh, the waitress was freaked out about that, <laughs> you know, and I just wanted to laugh. I mean, it's just a number, you know, there's nothing to worry about there. We're not superstitious. It's okay if your change is six dollars and sixty six cents, but the way I interpret the number and other interpreters interpret it this way as well, numbers in apocalyptic literature are often symbolic. So, in in Revelation, the number seven is the number of perfection. There's seven spirits, which I think refers to the Holy Spirit, and there's not seven Holy Spirits. 
but the number symbolic of the perfection and fullness of who the spirit is. So, so if, if seven is the perfect number, then I would argue that he uses the number 666 to stand for that which is evil and that which is opposed to God. So I don't understand the 666 to refer to uh, a particular individual trying to discern the name of a particular person who fits that number. Instead, I think John is saying this beast is not 777. It doesn't represent goodness and beauty and truth, but it's 666. It represents that which is evil, that which is opposed to God. So, um, you know, uh, that's that's a difficult matter. Maybe I'm wrong on that because others have tried, you know, as I already said, many think it's referring to Nero. It's uh, It may be a particular individual, but I lean, I lean in the other direction. So why is it that 777, or at least the number 7 itself, I guess, uh, has this these connotations of perfection, of, kind of representing God? Like, where does that come from? Yeah, I, I think it comes from the Old Testament itself. You know, the, it, it has the idea of completeness. The Lord, the Lord created the world in seven days. So, you know, it, it, it begins from, from the start. And then, you know, in Israel's calendar, it's a seven-day week, isn't it? Which concludes with the Sabbath. And then you, you have uh, sabbatical years. And, and as we go through the Old Testament, there's all kinds of references to uh, these different feasts, like tabernacles lasting seven days. So I, 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 now I think those are a literal seven days in the Old Testament. But I think, but I think, I think this language prepares us for the idea in Revelation, which is an apocalyptic book, that the number seven is is symbolic. So I'm not just to make sure I'm understood, I'm not arguing that everywhere in the Bible the number seven occurs, it's symbolic. I'm arguing that John picks up the number seven in the book of Revelation, and he employs it symbolically because he, it's apocalyptic. I think many pastors uh, might be somewhat intimidated by the idea of preaching through the book of Revelation. I think sometimes it probably just seems so difficult uh, interpretively, and also just fraught with controversy. And maybe on top of that, there's even the the sneaking suspicion that the spiritual benefit of preaching through the book just wouldn't be there, especially compared to other books where it, they just seem more uh, relevant to our everyday lives, more easy to apply, maybe speaking more to some of the key doctrines of the faith rather than just stuff in the future. So I guess my question is twofold. How would you respond to that that feeling that a pastor might have, and then what advice would you offer to a pastor who was uh, going to attempt to preach through the book? First, I understand that it can seem daunting. Secondly, I want to say, I think Revelation is such a crucial book to preach. So, I just want to give some examples. In chapter 1, there's, it's a great passage on, do you fear the future? Do you fear death? Jesus, uh, Jesus holds the, the the future in his hands. He he says, he, he, "Do you fear? Do you fear what the government might do to you?" He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's the one who has the keys of death and Hades. I mean, every everyone has to think of death. What's their ultimate destiny? And you know, the there's chapter four. God is the creator. Who, who rules the world? Is, is, are our lives spinning out of control? Um, so uh, also when we think of the book as a whole, we, we see more and more that society is opposed to the Christian faith. Well, that's what Revelation is all about. What do we do when society is turning against uh, Christianity? Oh, and, and Revelation says, here, here's what we're called to do. We're called upon to persevere. And secondly, we ought not to be surprised that, that there's, a, there's a great war going on between uh, Satan and God. Of course, God will win, but we understand we're in the war. And, and 
another thing is Revelation over and over again says, how can we have assurance that we belong to God? Well, he, in, in chapter 1, in chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 12, he says we can be assured, we can have confidence, we can have hope, we, our, our guilty conscience can be assuaged because of the cross of Christ. So I want to say the cross is just central to this book. And then Revelation warns us, right, chapters 17 and 18, about the, the dangers of unbridled materialism. I mean, that's a, that's a relevant message. And throwing your lot in with the world, loving the things of the world rather than the, than the things of God. And then Revelation reminds us there is a final judgment. I mean, that's important to know. Life, life on earth doesn't last forever. What's going to happen to those who do evil? And does it matter? Does it matter that we do what's good? Are we just, are we just frittering our lives away and there's no meaning in life? No, there's, there's a meaning. There's a, there's a new heaven and new earth coming. There's a, there's an amazing and unrivaled joy before us. And there's a judgment and uh, hell for those who reject. So, I mean, there's more that I could say, but I think it's a great and exciting book to preach. I preach to it myself, and our congregation, uh, I, I, I think it's not because it was me, but just because of the message. I think they loved it. Hmm. Yeah, that's encouraging. That uh, hopefully would be, yeah, an encouragement to pastors listening who, uh, yeah, there, m- there might be the assumption that they and even their, their congregations would have about the book, but uh, it's good to hear there's more there's more to it than what we often assume uh, practically speaking, what would you say are some of the biggest pitfalls that pastors would want to avoid when planning to preach, uh, maybe planning out the series, uh, actually doing the sermon prep, and then actually delivering the messages? Do you have any practical advice for avoiding pitfalls? Yes. I would say don't do too many messages. <laughs> you know, don't. I, I think there's a danger of spending too long in the book. Maybe. You, you know, you could do a shorter series, but I'd say 20 to 25 messages I'd recommend. You know, that, that way you, you can get bogged down in a book and kind of lose where you're going. So I, I think that's a very manageable thing. Um, be sure to keep the big picture in mind. I mean, of course, we always need to be reminded this as pastors. We're to explain the text well, but also, maybe I'm speaking to myself here, let's not get so much into explanation that we don't forget application. Whenever we, whenever we preach a text, especially Revelation, we need to always keep in mind as preachers, what does this say to people today? What's the message for our congregation right now, my congregation right now? What what is what is the Lord what is the Lord saying to us? And then fourthly, be just admit on some passages, I don't know. <laughs> Here's my best shot. Maybe, maybe that's not right. Um I, I think it's good to communicate to the congregation. I don't I don't have all the answers. We don't we don't have to have all the answers. I know what this book is mainly about, but I don't know what every detail's about and good people disagree. Well, Dr. Schreiner, thank you so much for spending some time talking with us today, sharing a little bit more about the book of Revelation and the the real gems that it contains for us. Appreciate you taking the time. Matt, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thanks so much. That was Tom Schreiner on the book of Revelation and the Mark of the Beast. For more, be sure to check out his commentary on Revelation in Crossway's ESV Expository Commentary Series, available online or at your local Christian bookstore. For more interviews like this, subscribe to the Crossway Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review, which helps us spread the word about the show. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.